So it's a pleasure to be here at this very nice conference, and I also would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present some work, which is work on the problem of quantum error correction in the presence of noise correlations. Actually, this is the outcome of our, the starting point of this work was the diploma thesis of Sandra Frank, I'd like to mention here, and this work is now continued by Stefan Brokhoff and Thomas Zell, my two PhD students. Okay, so let's get started. I would like to motivate what I'm going to talk about by, um, by a question, and this question is the following. So let's consider the quite typical or the quite generic situation where we have a bunch of uh, spins, which of course should represent some quantum register, and these spins are locally uh, coupled to a common environment. And now if you think about quantum error corrections, which of course we want to do on this quantum register which is represented by these spins, then we might ask ourselves whether this situation, where the spins coupled to a common bath, can be approximated by this situation where we have the spins coupling to their, their two independent environments. If this would be the case, if this would be a good approximation of this situation, then we would know for sure that the noise is independent, and then this would, I think many or most of you would agree, to would make quantum error correction much easier. Okay, I will address this question in a pretty simple model, which we think nevertheless captures the main features of this, of this situation. And then in this model, there will be necessarily some kind of noise correlations, and then the task is to figure out how this kind of noise, these noise correlations interfere with standard quantum error correction. And here I will do this mainly by presenting you a leading order estimate, which then will show that indeed this kind of correlations, which one can naturally expect in this situation, uh, sh should be taken serious because they significantly affect quantum error correction. We've also done some exact calculations, and if time allows, I will also represent results of these. Okay, so let's start with the physical model. We take n effective spin one half particles, which we represent the qubits, and these spins should be uh, coupled to a common bosonic bath. We think maybe we may think about photons or phonons in a condensed matter setting. And we assume that this coupling is linear and local. So the interaction Hamiltonian should be of this form. We have the sum over all spin over all spins and there's a local spin operator, SL, which could be some Pauli operator, multiplied by the local field strength, AL, of this bosonic field at the location of the L spin. And there's some overall coupling strengths, which are called, which I denote by G. So I emphasize there's no direct coupling between the spins. However, by the exchange of correlations in this system. And we have to figure out what will these noise correlations do to quantum error correction. So this is a pretty simple model, and also on the quantum error correction side, we also, we also want to be as simple as possible, so I consider just plain, just one cycle of quantum error correction at the very end of some time, with spins interact with this bath, and uh, we assume that this is ideal and instantaneous quantum error correction. So I'm not talking about fault-tolerant quantum error correction. Okay, so to come to the leading order estimate, I consider the following situation. We have an initial pure code state psi, which is in which the system is prepared, and then we expose the system during a time t to the bosonic bath. This can be, or this defines a noise operation, which I call uh, n of tau, which leaves us with an intermediate state psi prime. And now we have a recovery operation, ah, yeah, which um, I sh haven't specified sufficiently what is our uh, quantum error correction. So I will always assume that we use, for example, CSS codes, which allow us to correct up to t qubit errors. So t is always the number of correctable qubits. So we take a recovery operation which corresponds to, shots, to such a code. Uh, yes, and uh, when we may ask what is uh, the difference between psi, so the final result, psi double prime, and the initial one, psi. So what we need to consider, something like the residual error, which I denote by delta, which, is, which could be some norm between psi double prime and psi. And what is written here on the right side, this is already the leading order estimate, which now I want to motivate why this should be correct. So 
First, it's clear that the leading order to this error should seem often spin boson interaction process, which is of order T plus one, because this effect can affect T plus one spins, and these are one error more than we can correct. So this should contribute, contribute to this error. This explains already this factor where we have coupling strengths T squared to the power T plus one. There's an additional factor alpha, which is some time dependent function, but independent of G. Then we also expect that this um, contribution to the residual error should be proportional to the field strengths at the spins which are affected. This explains why we have here this uh, product of the field intensities at the locations L1 to Lt plus 1 of the spins which are affected. And then of course we have to take the thermal average of this operator product. And finally, where is uh, in a stochastic factor, we have n over, also the binomial n over t plus one. These are the number of choices which we have to pick out t plus one errors, or error sites. Okay, so if we agree on this simple estimate, we can draw already a few uh, simple conclusions. So here is, here's it again. Then it might be instructive to consider two limiting, limiting cases. I've forgotten to say that we have an additional parameter in our model, which is the distance between the spins, is denoted by A, and if we send this distance to infinity, when we are sure that the noise should be independent, this is the first case of independent noise, and when the fields are independent, then we can factorize this average over this operator product in a product over averages of the field intensities. And if you also impose translational invariance, this means that this intensity should be independent of the location, and then we get, we get just the average field intensity to the power t plus one. Now, the other limiting case is the opposite, when the distance a between the spins shrinks to zero, meaning that the spins are all sitting on more or less on the same spot, and uh, then they experience the same field, meaning that now this operator product is simply the power a, uh, the 2t plus 2 power of a, which we have to, from which we have to take the average. Now, employing Wick's theorem, this means that we again get uh, the intensity squared, or the intensity average to t plus one, but there's an additional prefactor just from Wick's uh, theorem, and this thing is uh, 2t plus one double factorial. And this actually, is a very large factor if t becomes large. So we can say that it doesn't matter what happened here, it's the same, the, uh, the residual error de deviates just by this factor. This means that in the case of vanishing spin distance, where we have strong, uh, strong correlations, the uh, residual error must be by huge factor larger than in the case of independent noise. So we can be a little bit more specific and we consider the case where we have a large number of spins and also a large number t of correctable errors such that the, cor the correct correctable error rate t over n is a constant q. Now we consider everything in the limit n and t to infinity when it's a simple matter to evaluate this expression which we just derived, leading order expression for a delta, and then we see that in the case of independent noise, Indeed, the things decays exponentially with n to zero, provided that the coupling constant g is less than a certain threshold value g naught. So that's a very simple version of the threshold theorem. And this threshold, of course, is given by the system parameters. Now, in the correlated case, so the opposite limit of vanishing spin distance, then it's the same up to this additional uh, double factorial factor, which here shows again up in the basis of this exponential. And this is very bad because now, however small we uh, choose this g, we have again this, we have this n and it's sufficiently large spin number n, this thing will become larger than one and then this thing's, this error diverges. So despite the fact that this is a pretty simple model, I think it's fair to say that this kind of correlations, which are induced by the exchange of bosons in a common bosonic bath, they seem to matter for the met for a quantum error correction. And the reason is, or we have seen it by the, this ratio, and this ratio diverges by 
due to the fact that we have here this uh, difference between the second moment to the power t and the uh, moment of uh, the, the two-teeth moment. I think also this simple analysis shows that a, per a, per a perturbative se series in the coupling strength G is pretty dangerous because if we, take the if we would take the series, we see that the first order contribution already diverges. And this, of course, this residual error cannot diverge, it's bounded to one or two. And uh, this means that higher orders must somehow cancel this thing so that everything diverges. And then finally, I'd like to mention that um, it is essential that I, in our model, the field strength is an unbounded operator, which also means that our spin boson interaction is an unbounded um, Hamiltonian. And if this would not be the case, so if this would be for some reason be bounded, then uh, the situation would be completely different because then one can show that this uh, ratio, which here diverges, in this case, it for, for so sufficiently large t should simply go to one. So this completely changes the picture. Okay, so this was just a simple leading order estimate and um, this motivated us to do some more serious work and we tried to avoid any kind of approximations and therefore we, and therefore we took it, uh, as an exactly solvable model and this is this dissipationless and spin boson model which was already mentioned I think yesterday which was also used by Unruh and Palmer et al. in a similar context. So it's basically um, what I've just said. We have a local coupling, and here this coupling commutes with the H0 Hamiltonian of the spins, and this makes the things very nicely solvable. This means in this situation we can explicitly write down this operation N of tau, and so this means that on the noise side, on the physical side, everything is very simple. Now, it, it, we have also done some, we have thought about what doing with the, um, which kind of CSS code we should choose. And uh, then we uh, concluded that the best would be to take all of them. So we consider the whole ensemble of NK CSS codes in the limit of a large spin number or qubit number N. And we fix the information rate, R, K over N. And then a nice thing of this ensemble is that almost all codes of these uh, codes are almost optimal, meaning that they reach a uh, correctable error rate Q, which is determined by, by this bound. And therefore, it makes sense to take the average over this entire ensemble, and then we define this quantity, which is more or less the same what we have just seen, now a slightly different definition. Here, that's the average fidelity of the channel N after correction RC, average over the code C, and this whole thing is then also average over this code ensemble, and one minus. So here we see the result for the independent noise. So A, the distance between the spins is set to infinity, and then we see very nicely that this residual error decays exponentially with N, which was, also, which was already observed by uh, Kelderbank and Shore. And uh, here this coefficient is determined by, uh, in general, time and distance dependent decoherence coefficient, which is proportional to g square. And here, of course, because we, we don't have any scale, so it is evaluated at zero distance. Uh, and we have to take k of zero and tau. And tau is the, the time uh, after which we do the quantum error correction. Now, this picture completely changes when we consider the case of correlated noise, then, so for any finite distance, then we see that this residual error, which would, de which decays exponentially for a, uh, a being infinity, now starts to saturate against the constant value for very large n. And this saturation value is written here. It is an exponentially minus the error rate of a correctable error rate divided, divided by the, uh, this um, decoherence coefficient, where here R is the spatial extension of the register. And this shows that this is a non-perturbative result because the coupling constant appears in the denominator of some exponential. And yeah, here's a little bit cheating because uh, the spatial extension also should depend on the number of spins which you have, and therefore one in principle, we should do some simple scaling analysis, 
which is seeing here, but because I'm running out of time, or how I'm doing in time? Five minutes. Okay, so we choose an example where we have n spins on a cubic array, and then the spatial extension of the entire system should scale with the third root of the, the spin number n, or qubit number, and also we didn't know what to, what to do with the observation time, so we said it should be at least scale like the distance, the maximum distance in the system, so it should scale the same, and then assuming that we have an, an ohmic bosonic path, this would mean then we can do some, can um, extract the scaling of this decoherence function, and you see where comes the power n one third out of it. And this then is the cor correct or the more correct um, dependence of delta on n, where we have into taking account this n dependence. And we've seen it doesn't change much. It is still a strong decay for independent paths or a to infinity. And in contrast to that, uh, the performance for a, a common path is much much worse. And therefore, I think it's justified to say that um, standard quantum error correction is significantly affected by this kind of boson exchange inter, um, correlations in the noise. So then I, I would like to conclude. So in the beginning, I've posed a question, and now we, I, we have seen that the answer is negative. We cannot just assume that, in this, in, at least in this I think quite generic situation, but this is equivalent to this situation, which would be nice for the theory of quantum error correction. We have to take uh, this kind of noise correlation seriously. And this, is, uh, this was first derived by a simple argument, and this can be confirmed by an exact calculation. And of course, I've answered one question, but at the same time, I think there, it is, there are many new open questions, so of course, I expect there can be an improvement by using decoherence-free subspaces. And I'm not sure about the impact of fault-tolerant quantum computation. And uh, I'm also not so sure whether these results uh, um, say something also to the quite new results on, the, on an improved uh, threshold theorems. Okay, that's it what I want to say, and thank you. Unfortunately not. So, but I th I'm sure it, it's uh, so. Um, we have to. We have written. Uh, Stefan Borkov has written a paper on what happens with decoherence-free subspaces when we have a finite distance, and what is left to do to combine this with this with quantum error correction, which is not so easy. Uh. I have a question. Yeah. So uh, the, the graph that's up there. The different lines are different temperatures. Um, no, these are different values of the uh, distance parameter. Okay. Yeah. So how does, it, how does this depend on the temperature? Is it uh, the temperature is, so this K is linear in temperature. Linear in temperature. Linear in temperature. Okay. Yeah. yeah.